the early end of her, her, her situation, talk about behavioral modifications, this, that, and the other, that office visit is maybe 50 or $60, you know? And so you really incentivize, like we said, treating the disease rather than preventing the disease, you know? And it's, it, and it's built into the entire system, and so it's just, it, it's not as easy as saying, you know, I'm just gonna be a good human being, and I'm, it, it's, just, it, it's a systemic issue. It's a systemic issue. But what I would find very interesting, you know, now he was saying, you know, there's this value-based purchasing, and the whole thought is like paying for outcomes, and 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 so you see a lot of hospitals now, and they're kind of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're 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 basically um, creating, for lack of better terms, they're creating order sets. And so to deal with this disease, you do this. To deal with this disease, you do that. To do, deal with this disease, you do that. And these are order sets that are based on research that shows that if you do this, you'll have the best outcome. What I think, though. Uh, is one of the bad side effects of that is we as physicians aren't really physicians anymore. I don't feel like I feel like we're technicians, and I think that actually takes the human aspect out of medicine, you know. Um, and so I think that actually kind of that has an unintended consequence. When I see a patient, it's funny. There's one hospital I go to. You've got pneumonia. Pneumonia order set. I'm done. Whereas before I used to think, okay, well, let me do this. Now, now what are you feeling? And what? Oh, okay, maybe this antibody. Now I don't even need to really interact with you that much. You've got a diagnosis. I'm gonna click a box. On to the next one, you know. And so the, they do that because they want to ensure that you have good outcomes, and these studies have shown if you do this, you have the best outcomes, and then they're going to get more money because of value-based purchasing, but it also kind of takes the humanity out of medicine, I think, to an extent, which is one of the unintended consequences. See, I think you could look at that the other way, too. Probably. <laughs> that because you're freed from worrying about some of those details, you have more time to invest in sort of the interaction. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, this order checking is, your complaint is a common one, and I think that I share it for certain things. But it also creates some standardization that removes errors in true. ways that are, you know, we're, we're human dealing with very complex systems. And, you know, when people come in for belly pain, that's depression, that's infection, that's heart attack, and having some standardization certainly help. The question is how much is the right amount? Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right there. It ensures that everybody gets the same care, which is, yeah. I think the other way, you, you mentioned the report card, and this is one of my, uh, problems with our system the way it's turned is our report cards are now including customer service rankings how nice are we how and and how nice are we often equates to did we give the patient what they want and oftentimes what the patient wants is not exactly the best option but I get dinged I get emails I get calls from the customer service department and everything this patient complained about you you didn't give them their meds. I was like, well, did we talk about the fact that maybe you didn't need the meds anymore? It doesn't matter, address the issue. And I'm just like, but patient care is actually at the utmost and we've started to turn the healthcare system, rightfully so in a lot of respects, um, we're, we're trying to turn it into being more patient-centered in the sense we wanna keep people happy and everything, but it's also, I would argue, taking away from our clinical decision-making. Because uh, my administrator, my executives will start telling my doctors, do this to make the patient happy. Yeah. Um, and, and that is often not the outcome that we want as well, too, especially when it comes to certain medications. Oh, pain medi oh, yes. Yes, pain That's medications. Part of the issues we have now. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, we're at odds with that as well. We want to make you happy, but sometimes we kind of know a little bit more that what you want is not necessary or is not best for you even. Um, but I've, I've definitely done some pleasure seeking sort of decisions. I'm like, all right, it's not gonna hurt, I'll go ahead. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I feel bad doing that, but at the same time, I gotta get to the next it's patient. Report card. It's on my report card. This is pure honesty, y'all. <laughs> this is our perspective. What more can we tell you about um, what we do, about what we see, about the healthcare system, actually. Is there a, please. So, the gentleman just, you, uh, just mentioned that uh, a large part of the problem was systemic. Is it, is it the, is the onus lying with the health, with the insurance companies? Or is it lying with the hospitals, where the hospitals are set up? Like, where would we, yes. like if I had the choice to choose from one insurance company versus another, and I mean the other one was doing, was compensating doctors in a way that was more in tune with what the patient needs for help versus what the what the insurance company wants to to make in terms of money. Then I would choose if I had the option, I would choose that health insurance company if I had the choice. 
but I don't know who's, I guess my question is, whose fault is it and who's doing it right so I can work with them? It's everybody's fault that they did. It's everybody's fault. <laughs> you're not going to find a villain and that you're just going to lock up and throw away the key. This is a system. Everybody's playing the same game. It's, the hospitals aren't innocent. They're also not guilty. You know, the insurance companies aren't innocent. They're not guilty either. It's just this is a system that's grown over the course of 150 years. You know, is, there, is there a healthcare system in another country that's mm -hmm. more in line with what you or any of you think that we should be mimicking? Mm. I mean, yeah. I would love to say yes, but we're never going to be another country such that we could adopt their healthcare system. When we had the conversation around the Affordable Care Act, we talked about single payer. It's not American. We just didn't want it. Mm. We talked about some of, I mean, we have examples of foreign countries here in the United States. I mean, the VA acts like the German system, mm. right? Medicare acts like the Canadian system already here. It's just that the American system is American. We're not going anywhere with it. We're not going to overhaul it. We can just let it evolve over time with the best of our efforts. But if you're looking for like, if, if I just go to this hospital and this doctor is going to be perfect, you're not going to really find that. What you can do is, you, if you know what your healthcare challenges are and what your spins are related to um, pharmaceuticals and you know whatever dependence you have, pick the right plan that's worth, that's worth it for you government is really doing a lot right now through the Affordable Care Act, through Medicare, to do the um, Center for Innovation, to try out a lot of innovative programs. And as the largest payer in the country, when they start creating incentives, insurance companies follow behind, providers get better aligned, like, we're going to get there, but it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, um, so I have a question regarding value-based care. So. With that being based on the outcomes, do any of you see that impacting decisions by providers to serve in minority communities oh, who already <laughs> are more likely to have about bad outcomes on the onset? Oh, definitely. I mean, I, it's, <laughs> I so many different ways to answer it. Mm -hmm. um, the major set of outcomes that we're responsible for in primary care are those larger chronic conditions that unfortunately affect our communities in a disparate way, right? So I am being held to different outcomes regarding diabetes, mm. high blood pressure, mm. depression, um, and unfortunately I, can, I could sit there for an hour and talk to certain of my diabetic patients, right? give them education about how they should be eating and what their medicines are doing to their bodies and therefore how they should take them and everything. But the long and the short of it is they're going to go home and they're going to eat the food that they can afford. They're going to exercise in the way that they can, but a lot of times they can't because they don't have the capacity in their neighborhood because of a lot of the safety issues. They can't afford a gym. There is no gym close to them, things like that, right? So as much as different payers or the government or whoever are judging me on whether or not my diabetics are controlled, I don't have control over that. So the, the difficulty is then how do we actually enforce this, right? So there's this difference between what's called process measures and outcomes measures, right? So it's not so much are my diabetics controlled, but am I ordering the right tests on them in the regular intervals to just make sure that I'm informed and they're informed. So, the, the example is for diabetes, we take this one test and it gives us whether or not you're controlled over the long term. It's called the A1C. Probably a lot of your family members and my family members measuring their A1C, right? So it's not so much, is their A1C less than eight or seven or nine or whatever that insurance company is doing, but did you draw that blood test on an annual basis? Like, are you giving it attention? That's the process. Um, but at the same time, like, sure, I could be a really bad doctor and order A1Cs on all my diabetics and I would look good, you know? So it, it doesn't really match with the, out, the outcomes that we want, but that's one of the ways they're starting to ease us into this, looking at processes that were unfortunately standardizing order sets a little more, essentially, um, as opposed to holding us individually responsible. Because that's the fear from, from our side, that we're gonna be held individually responsible when we know that the majority of the decision making is by the patient and it doesn't really have to do with us. Just if I could just add on to that in the space of mental health, 
Um, another one of the challenges is just the lack of availability of what's called evidence-based treatments in community settings. So these are treatments that have been shown by the literature to be effective at improving depression, anxiety, whatever, and they they're just don't exist in the majority of um, kind of community health center settings, and there is an extreme dearth of providers that are able to effectively deliver those interventions. And so that, of course, also um, influencing influences the person's getting better. Um, and a lot of times, people don't really know that. They show up, if they actually cross that barrier to actually showing up to a mental health provider, you know, that's a huge enough step in and of itself, and they don't know that there's, you know, a list of 10 different psychological interventions, and some might be more appropriate to treating what, what they're presenting with than others, and to, again, ask those questions and find out if they're getting kind of the state of our treatment um, or not. And even if you do find someone that's delivering evidence-based care, you know, waiting six months, three months to, to actually get an appointment. Thank you. Thank you. I, you were kind of asking, I think, like, are, are some docs cherry-picking patients based mm -hmm. on the fact that they think that they may present more of a risk? More communities that they or, or, yeah, Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, I mean, they're, they're already doing that. Yeah, How many yeah. doctors really are seeing Medicaid patients? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're cherry-picking based on how they're being paid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there are a couple good studies that I just want to touch on that help to inform this. One of the early stages of this process was public reporting. They weren't sure we could paid for people to do better, but if you at least reported how people's outcomes were, you would incentivize people out of shame to do better care. So this started in New York. What they found, and they started it with cardiothoracic surgery, so if you had coronary artery bypass, they would report your outcomes, how many of your patients did well and how many of them died. As the reporting evolved, doctors would take less risky patients in order to make their numbers look better. Well, Who's going to be more risky? People who have unstable home situations with multiple comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension. And those patients ended up being sequestered more likely in academic medical centers rather than spread widely. And so people were hustling to make their numbers look better by rejecting certain members when public reporting happened. Another example, the second iteration of this value-based design was um, certain pay for performances. So some of the things Dr. Matthews described Look, if you do enough A1Cs, you don't have to know the number, but you have to have, what, like 75% of them done amongst your patient population, and we'll give you a financial bonus. A lot of those were based at a number, right? You had to get 75% of those things done. Certain communities were at, like, 74%. So they didn't actually have to do much investment to improve enough to get to that bar in order to get a financial bonus. Others were at 39%, right? which providers are most likely to be caring for the ones that are 39%. And so if you actually have to improve by 40 basis points in order to get your bonus, what you're creating is the rich get richer, right? And so you're worsening disparities rather than improving disparities by virtue of this effort to improve quality for everybody. I mean, a rising tide does not lift all boats, right? We've learned that a thousand times over. We like to use that slogan, but it is rejected at every time you hear it as it pertains to race in America. Right? It does not exist for racial disparities. There need to be really tailored, focused programs. They need to take context into account. Incentives need to be provided. If you're hoping this happens out of the goodness of people's heart, it will never be sustainable. Um, but those are just two examples. I mean, I can go on, but using value-based insurance design can improve quality and reduce cost, but it has to be really, really carefully deployed. Lot of work I, I've been fortunate enough to start within our clinics what we call a behavioral health integration program so it's the concept that because we have traditionally treated behavioral health and psychiatry as especially same as like dermatology cardiology psychiatry right so instead it's this larger concept that we need to integrate behavioral health across the board with primary care 
that in the same day that you see your primary care doctor talk about preventive issues as far as cancer screening or, or nutrition or physical activity, you should also be talking with a behavioral health specialist to talk about your stress, how you're dealing with problems, how you are functioning uh, you know, within your own uh, current life. Um, and so, yes, there's definitely been problems as far as, not problems, but difficulties in bringing those two teams together, not so much because we don't function well together, but it's just the logistics of it. Unfortunately, I always go back to the payer sort of things, but sometimes you can't get both vis visits paid for on the same day. Or sometimes there's just not actually more, usually there's just not enough behavioral health specialists out there. Um, and so when we need to address certain issues, even if I want to integrate a, a, a practice such as my own, I've been trying to hire a psychiatrist, social worker for the past two, three years. I still have open jobs. There's, not, there's just not enough of them, unfortunately, coming through training. Um, to address these issues so I think it's very possible and thankfully a lot of the work and again coming out of the government as far as innovation funding and, and program development is to enforce these sort of practices they're new we're figuring it out uh, we're trying to do more group visits running groups with a, a specialist and a primary care doc or joint appointments where you can see at the same time so you can actually have conversations about your physical concerns as well as your behavioral health concerns I think the one thing that we do know, at least uh, from the evidence, is that you can't divorce the two, at least of the conditions of the patients, because your diabetes may make, be making you more depressed, but your depression may be keeping you from taking your medications for your diabetes, so we can't separate the two. So hence why we're trying to come up with ways to do this uh, in a more innovative delivery. I'm curious how many of you know that you've gotten a depression screening when you go see your primary? survey that they make you take? It may be a survey, it may be in the form of two questions or nine questions that um, your primary care physician will ask you around your mood, appetite, sleep, things like that. So that, I mean, that's enlightening in and of itself. That's a recommendation set forth by the U.S. Preventive Task Force that people are supposed to get regular depression screenings when they go see um, primary care physicians, and that often does not happen. And typically, primary care is the gateway to either, you know, a low level of treatment for um, a lot of psychiatric disorders, and the gateway to then refer to a mental health specialist. Um, so those are things that you could start by talking with your primary care doctor about. Um, I have a question for Adrian and Thomas. I guess you'll uh, be able to relate to this. So um, I'm a dietitian. So when I was doing my internship, um, I was at Schroeder and I was there for um, a while. While I was there, some of my um, fellow interns at that time had horrible thoughts of African Americans and how they eat and how they live and how they take care of themselves. And also I have a, a master's in health education, so kind of focusing on public health and policy. I started getting just like, oh, forget it, they're never going to listen, barely any minorities that are dietitians to begin with, and what would be your recommendation to keep that momentum, and if you had any um, suggestions, or even if you had any conversations that you've had with your fellow um, um, students, or uh, for yourself, um, or just your colleagues, just any advice, positive, hopefully, but even if there's roadblocks, how do you get past them? Um, nutrition so one of the first thing I'll say come and teach me <laughs> because um, it's true like in medical school I mean I we get like zero education like on good nutrition I mean probably like negative and it's like and it's a major problem because it just it makes absolutely no sense because we go to these health fairs and we're supposed to provide education about like good nutrition and I don't I barely know anything about good nutrition we stay a little bit of biochem and supposedly nutrition so so I, I would say like the first thing I mean like just honestly personally is come and see if there's ways to come and teach like people like me and like uh, and like you know our physicians assistants our nurses our physicians in particular to really say like you know uh, um, you know what type of education is going on for these physicians because we don't even know for ourselves how to keep ourselves healthy and so much less like you know how are we gonna get like provide good recommendations for patients I know that you definitely get a lot more like especially like in the I'm still like in the preclinical stages and so in the clinical stages it becomes a little bit better and then you know, hopefully in residency, supposedly in theory, you know, but in theory, but <laughs> but you know, you know, we talk about this all the time. It's like as a medical school, when do you really learn about prevention? And 
like, you know, upperclassmen, interns will tell you, well, they kind of learned a little bit anecdotally when they were in the family mess, like when they were doing family med, you know, because that's like the only people who really care, you know, <laughs> who like enough about nutrition. So, so I think it's a huge, like nutrition is such a huge issue. Um, I mean, we can always go back to like the health fairs and stuff like that and all those things, but I mean, just on a constricted personal level, I don't know enough about it. It's something that I want to be more educated on. And so if you could find ways to come and teach, you know, me and my fellow peers, I would love to have you. I think um, a lot of the work that I do outside of my day job is more uh, kind of workforce development and diversity issues as far as recruiting more uh, of us into healthcare. Because uh, we, we definitely spoke to, and you know, the question earlier, should I just find a black doc, right? So many of us kind of want to turn to ourselves to help ourselves with this situation. Well, will definitely tell you that's not the only solution, but it definitely helps, right? So one of the things that I uh, do in order to keep myself um, invested and excited in my job and not feel so frustrated by others around me who you know, may not agree with my philosophy or, you know, because uh, it is difficult to be in a sort of situation where people look down on patients that look like you and, and things like that. One of the things I try to do as much as possible is find my colleagues in my field, it may not be in my hospital, but join support organizations. Um, so, and in fact, <laughs> I, we, my best friends and I, we actually founded our own, and now we all support each other, and all we do, literally, messages going crazy, is text each other, man, this dude said it at work today, how should I respond to him? Like, we have a, like a little electronic support group because it gets so frustrating at work. You know, I mean, it's happened to all of us. You're in a hospital and you're in training somewhere and you're attending or somebody just completely ignores what the patient says, right? Completely ignores. And you know you could connect with this patient due to some sort of background issue or something, but the attending just totally ignores it. And the patient, whether it's a cancer diagnosis or something, the patient is devastated and you could tell there's a communication issue right there. So. That's the one thing that I, we reach out to each other as colleagues, we turn to ourselves in this as being the, the minorities in the situation, unfortunately, to try to find out, all right, how would you deal with the situation? How would you stay motivated? How would you stay excited about your job when every day you're kind of surrounded by just animosity, whether it be from your colleagues or even your patients? Um, so I support groups, I mean, um, he mentioned Student National Medical Association in, in medical school, that's basically the, the black students. Yeah, in some schools, the Latinos are included as well. But all four of us as MDs were in SNMA at some point. That was like our only option in medical school. And it got me through. I don't know about you guys, but my SNMA chapter was the only reason I'm why still I still of both of them. No, I'm, I'm an <laughs> alumni officer. I'm still involved and I've been out of school. So like for dietitians or for any of your fields, it, it's not even healthcare just staying professionally focused, sometimes you do need to turn to your own support network, um, and not just your family, but others who are doing the work that you do so that you can stay as, as positively motivated as possible. So that's my recommendation. Yeah, we talked about food access and food sustainability, and mm -hmm. people thought that food, um, healthy food was actually a privilege and not a right. And I had to argue that, and then I just became this advocate, and I was like, I'm getting tired of doing this all the time. I'm always the main person saying something, but yet I had to keep defending, you know, myself or even just where I've grown up. Like I came from, I'm, I'm from Flint, Michigan, so where I've grown up and the things that I've been through, and then living in Chicago, I'm like, oh, this is I can deal with this, <laughs> you know, you know, certain issues, and I have to continue to talk to people and say, no. You know, you come from a privileged background, but you have to understand that everyone has a right to healthy food and access to quality, good nutrition. Because I, I've done research where you can go down four or five blocks and realize there's 16 unhealthy fruit and, uh, food options, but then there's no healthy option except for the jewel that's not well maintained. And then how do you continue to have that conversation? And then you all will see those individuals and their A1Cs will be through the roof and then, you know, or their just all their issues and their problems because they yeah. like sharks more than going to jewels. I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, and it's, and it's hard, you know. Yeah. I think as professionals, we need to support ourselves, support each other so that we yeah. can continue this work and, and of helping others. But, you know, my favorite phrase is always, you know, put your own mask on first before you... I had uh, working for a credit bureau. I just wanted to know if you could clear something up for me. Uh, I do IT security, so I won't say what bureau I was working for, but... 
they were acquiring healthcare, healthcare analytics hospitals. There's different streams, revenue streams with this data, and one of them were two hospitals. Well, I mean, there's no denying that there are, unfortunately, and have always been, um, you know, restrictions based on finance on how we care, how we deliver care, you know, within this country. So the fact that they're doing it on a more, you know, electronic and analytical basis doesn't surprise me at all. But there are definitely, even within our own system, hospitals that turn patients away that can't pay for it. I mean, even though there are rules, yes, there is, uh, you know, legalities involved. You can't turn people away from emergency rooms, but hospitals turn patients away on a daily basis if they can't afford certain outpatient clinics or surgeries and things like that. And unfortunately, that is not illegal in this country. The only thing is illegal is that you must take care of them in the emergency room if there's a life-threatening issue. There is no other requirement in this country that hospitals take care of you. So that is unfortunately the largest social determinant basically of the <laughs> evening that if you don't have money to get health care, uh, it's highly likely that you'll not, you will not access the system because there's no rule otherwise. But anyway, thank you all for this this uh, this evening. I hope uh, you got a lot out of the conversation. And uh, see you. Right. Give it up for our panel. The, the reason why we try to have these conversations, um, especially in regards to maybe topics that a lot of black folk might not want to actually, people of color might not want to talk about. It's because we want to see, we want to try to dis, 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 dismiss that that myth, right? Because raise your hand if you got something out of the conversation, right? You, you, you learned something that you necessarily didn't come in here with the, any knowledge of. And I think that's the most important piece. And that's kind of why we do this speaker series, at least why we created it from, from a metro perspective, is because we, we need to know this. Because if out of, outside of education, the only place we have to go to learn any kind of medical information is through WebMD, and that sucks. Okay? <laughs> um, so it's good that we can come to our peers, right, and, and learn, and ask questions, and not be afraid of, of what we might hear. And even from vice versa, but you guys sort of learn from some of the people that might be your patients eventually about what are their concerns, and what are some things that maybe um, you can integrate in the various spaces that you you are or will become. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad I came. <laughs> um, for, for a little bit of housekeeping, um, Metropolitan Board definitely is a young professional uh, auxiliary of the Chicago Urban League. We do a, a wide variety of different things, um, but we also want members. Um, Akua, raise your hand. Akua Davis, raise your hand. Um, is our membership chair. If you want to learn more about what Metroport is, what we do, please definitely go talk to her. Um, I'm taking over uh, what our duties from for our president in the back, but I definitely want to acknowledge her. Really? Uh huh? You say what? Okay, thank you. Uh, she will say a few words to you guys too. So thank you to the panelists again for an awesome discussion. Um, truth hurts sometimes, so you know, learning about what's going on in healthcare is. I think it's good to have that knowledge. Also, thank you to our sponsors, IMD, and also the Red Cross for opening up this great building for us. Thank you to Steve for his vision for the whole speaker series. This is our fifth installment. <laughs> and also to the PPD committee who helped him put this on as well. If you like this discussion, please join us in November, I think on the 15th, for our next installment of the speaker series. It's called Black on the Ballot. It's talking about um, how, um, I think like, leaders can be um, elected and like have that impact, you know, like on the community. So, um, Plug for Metro Board, as I said, is a great organization. We not only have these discussions and stuff, but we are also out there serving our community. So that's, if, if that's something that you want to do, that you're interested in, please join us. And also know that it's not just here in Chicago, it's a national movement. So. If you join, you have friends nationally, you have a national connection. So it's just overall, it's a great organization to be a part of. So again, 
If you have any questions, please assault the Kua afterwards. And what about with membership? <laughs> please see a Kua or, or myself or Steve or um, Emmanuel as part of the uh, team as well as Ariana. Any of us can answer your questions um, about the organization. So thank you again for coming out on a Wednesday night. And we also do fun things like go out and 